And today, as we wrap up your series, I want to let you know, even though it's been a marriage series, today's principle applies to every area, every relationship, not just in marriage. A few months ago, my wife and I came out of the uh, our local Publix grocery store, bags in hand, heading back to our car, and we heard that horrible noise of metal on metal. You ever heard a car accident? Oh, it's a horrible sound. In the parking lot, of all things, we turn and look the direction where I heard, and I saw an old mid-90s sedan front wheel going over the roof of another car, bouncing on the windshield, then on the hood, then down to the ground. And that car that had done all the damage, once it got down, saw a woman driving, who she just spun her tires out, went out of the parking lot as quick as she could. Well, I was just stunned. Fortunately, some people had enough presence of mind to take out their cell phones, take a picture of the license plate. Others are dialing 911. We were all wondering, what in the world happened? So we started walking over to that other car, and that guy pulled over into a little parking space, and we're all coming up to him and just kind of going, what was that? And he turned out and he stuck his head out the window and said, it's okay, just a mad (laughs) ex-girlfriend. Oh, made you wonder what happened in that relationship, doesn't it? And, you know, you think about it, there's so much pain that happens in relationships that go afoul. And yet, you know, all the stuff we've done, all the technology we have, we all have these cell phones. Think about everything this can do. It can tell you exactly where you are, how to go where you want to go, where your kids and your spouse are. You can watch television programs from all over the world, communicate with people anywhere, have all kinds of computer programs, all in a little device that's in your pocket. And yet, in spite of all our technology, we have not, as people, figured out how to make our relationships work. And you know what the crazy thing is? 2,000 years ago, Jesus Christ came and told us how to do it. We just haven't been following his instructions. And so today, whatever your problem is, I want you to know how to fix it. Jesus told us, and I know this works. I've experienced it in my life, and it's true. You know, the number one cause that of most or nearly all, I should say nearly half of marriages ending in divorce is unresolved conflict. It's also a reason so many people in America today don't even get married. They just live together thinking somehow they'll avoid the pain. But it doesn't hurt any less when a relationship ends. You know, and we have conflict between parents and children, between siblings and one another, co-workers, friends. On and on it goes. And yet there's a solution that works. The question is, do we know what it is and can we do it? Well, after today, you won't have an excuse for not knowing. The real question will be, will you do it? And so when you want to fix something, do you you ever go online and find one of those self-help videos? Like YouTube has a lot of those. Some people have started businesses to help people know how to fix their appliances, their cars. I even replaced a tile in my swimming pool based on one of those videos showing me how to do all the work to make it happen. You know, and it's great, isn't it? It's wonderful to have all this information. And even if you go to the doctor, there's a two-step process. The first one is to figure out what's wrong with you. The second is to figure out what to do because of it, right? In, In the medical world, world we call it the diagnosis and the prognosis well let's call it today the why do you have the problem the how do you fix it and that's it and the bible gives us both of these the why do you have conflicts among you and james in his letter in james chapter 4 starting in verse 1 he gives us the most common answer one of three i'll give you this start with the letter p He says, what causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from the desires that battle among you? You want something. That's the reason you have conflict. And most of the time, that's the case, right? You want something, somebody else has it. Anybody had a sibling growing up? Anybody have uh, your parent with more than one child? How many times have you heard the word, mine? Right? Anybody work in the nursery? Mine! No, mine, no, mine, back and forth, back and forth. (coughs) You want something, somebody else has it, you want to take it away from them. And that's what James is saying is at the root of so much of our conflict. You desire but do not have, so you kill. Okay, maybe you don't commit murder, but have you ever killed a relationship because you wanted something that somebody else isn't willing to give you? You covet, but you cannot get what you want, you, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. But when you do ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. And I'm calling this first why pleasure, because I can all start with the letter P, so that you can make this connection. 
Really, it's about wanting. It's whatever you want. And we live in a society that has been built on giving us what we want. I mean, even think the Declaration of Independence started with, and God has given us these uh, undeniable rights, the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And so we are convinced we deserve to be happy. And we're going to be happy by getting more stuff. So we deserve to get what we want. And that pollutes all of our relationships. I remember doing a wedding when I was pastoring uh, just outside of Seattle for a couple. And I walk them through premarital counseling, tell them how to resolve conflict, tell them it's not going to be exactly like those Disney movies you saw growing up. But somehow, you know, they, they, people run into that a few months in. And sure enough, about three and a half months in, got a phone call from the bride, 1130 at night. Pastor Ellen, you got to come over to our house right now. It's over. I just can't go on. He doesn't love me. I'm like, so, okay, there I am. You're going over in the middle of the night. And trying to intercede to see what's happening. And it turns out they both, like so many Americans today, had expectations about what marriage meant and felt entitled to certain things that their spouse would give them. So the husband felt like after a hard day's worth of work, he deserved, it was his right to come home and play video games for five hours. Now he was going to blow off steam and that was it. But the wife, she felt it was her right, her entitlement to have her husband give her nonstop attention for five hours. And so there was a lot of conflict. And they both were arguing and feeling that lack of, wait a second, you're not giving me what you promised. Because they had this deeply embedded idea of what they deserved and what was their right. And you know, this affects all kinds of relationships. I think of even a friendship. What, what happens when one day you tell somebody, hey, I'd like to be your friend. And then they get mad at you because it's been 22 minutes since you last texted them. I mean, what, what does it mean? And, and we have these ideas of, of what is boiled into that. And, and so pleasure or, or getting what we want, our stuff, our ideas is a big reason that we struggle. Another one also starts with P is power. And some people are really driven by power. I mean, I, I've just noticed there are certain types of people who are not comfortable being in a car unless the steering wheel is in their hands. You know, they're the kind of people, hey, I'll take you out for dinner. I'll be sure to come by. I can drive. No, no, no. I'll drive and get you. You know, I've known people who actually get sick to their stomach. I had to pull over and, and, and let them throw up alongside the road because they could not handle not having the steering wheel in their hands. And the same thing's true of their relationship. They've got to be the driver for the relationship. And sometimes it's a fear that somebody's going to steer them wrong or somehow they just have this intense drive. And that's another thing that's fed by our culture. You know, capitalism is great. America's got the best economy in the world, but it's built on competition. And we view everything through competition. That's why you pay so much money to go at a professional sporting event because we want to watch people compete. And sometimes we take this into everything we do. I mean, you ever been up there, it's pulled up at a signal light next to somebody, and vroom, 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 there it is going right there. You know, it's like, who's going to be the first to go away there? Or you're pulling onto the highway, and there's a car, and you know you could let them go, but you want to go in that middle lane, so zoom, you pass on ahead of them so you can get ahead of them because you don't want to lose. Everything is a win or a lose proposition, and you're not going to be a loser. You're going to win. And that comes into your relationships, doesn't it? And then what does that mean? When you get into a marriage relationship and everything is a win or a lose? Well, think about that. If I'm the husband and my wife is my partner, I mean opponent. If she wins, I lose. Do I want to put up with that? No, I'm going to win. and She's going to lose. Now, is that a healthy marriage? You ever think about it? I mean, relationships are the one game, the only way you can win is by losing. Because if I win and you lose, the relationship loses, and ultimately I lose the relationship, so I lost. But if we win, we both win. But for us to win, you have to win. So if I don't worry about my winning, and I instead focus on you winning, then we win. This works. This is it. But it requires a dramatic mind change from the way our culture has embedded things in us. So you got to watch out for the pleasure and the power. But the third reason sometimes we have conflict is actually a legitimate one. Thank you, Glenn. And it's called perspective. 
were you raised in one of those families where you had a parent, maybe a father or a mother, that you never challenged? I mean, they were a dad, and dad was the boss. And that one time that dad pulled on the highway and left the blinker on, dink, 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 down the road, and from the back seat, you were just learning how cars work. You said, Daddy, you forgot to turn off the blinker. And dad turned around and said, how dare you talk back to me? I'm your father. Do you understand? And you're like, oh, 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 shaking back there in the back seat. Oh, okay, daddy, I understand. I'll never, ever point that out again. And then blink, 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 blink. 145 miles later, blink, 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 blink. And you don't dare point out anything, any errors whatsoever. But the problem is we don't always see everything, do we? And if we're not willing to listen to other people, we can never improve. The best leaders are those who are willing to listen to those around them because no one person sees everything, knows everything, understands everything. My wife and I enjoy riding bikes, and we, I was on a bike ride yesterday, and Kira had bought me a new set of wheels a couple months ago, a new brand I never had before. And a guy came up to me, and he said, you know, I've been watching. Do you notice your, your rear skewer quick release? You don't ride a bike. Let's just say it's the thing to hold your back wheel in place. He said, you know, that's open a little bit. Those are designed to be closer into your wheel. And he told me, I once was on a ride, and we were getting close to town, and we have the little city limit sign. We have a little mini race to see who's going to get there first. And the guy was up, started to sprint, and suddenly his wheel came out, and he went flying across the pavement. His bike busted into pieces because he didn't have that close. And was I glad that guy came up and told me that? Absolutely. But sometimes you ever find, and of course it's not you, but any people you work with, who whenever something's pointed out, they automatically assume your motives are bad. You're just trying to win. This is a game again, and you want to win, and you want to put me down. And no, I'm not going to listen to you. Can you get any better? No, you can't grow. It requires a mind change. I mean, there are times we need to have conflict, but we need to have a good fight. That is the intentions of both involved are saying we want us, whether the us is our marriage, our parent-child relationship, our church, our company. We want to be the best we can be, and that means we need to be willing to listen to some people who may have a different perspective than we have. And so, now once you've got your diagnosis, now we can take a look at the prognosis. What is the how? How are you going to get better? And then we get to turn to the greatest sermon ever preached in human history, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 5. In fact, if you have your Bible, I want you to turn there because it's such a powerful passage. I'll never forget being at 18 years old, Jesus came into my life in a dramatic way. And he called me to surrender my life and transform what I did. And I started reading the Bible every day. And I came to this passage, and I remember reading it going, What? And then I started to put into practice what it says. Let me tell you, it was a dramatic turnaround. Verse 21, you've heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment. Makes sense, right? You don't want to murder. I mean, even in America today, murder, capital punishment, all that stuff, bad, bad, bad to kill people. <laughs> but then Jesus says, I say to you, everyone who is angry with his brother, this doesn't just mean your physical brother you're raised in the same household with. It's anybody you have a relationship with. Anyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. What? Whoever insults his brother will be liable to the council. And whoever says you fool will be liable to the hell of fire. That's crazy. Anger would be that much. And then he goes on to give us a picture of how worship happened in the Jewish system. They would come to the temple, they would bring an offering to God, they would take it up there to the altar. Now we today, we worshipped here. We, were, we just had a great time of worship. Miranda and Keenan and the team did a phenomenal job, didn't they? You've got an incredible worship team here. Got to experience the presence of God. This is the highest duty that man can have, being in the presence of God, giving God our very best. Same sort of thing. And, but Jesus said, if you are offering your gift at the altar, and there remember your brother has something against you. That is, this person in relationship with you is angry at you for something. Jesus doesn't even say whether it's really your fault or not. He just said your brother's angry at you. There's something that is interfering with your relationship with another person. Jesus said, leave your gift at the altar. Go. Go, look at that word, go, first be reconciled to your brother, then come and offer your gift. 
And the first principle of the how is the go. Because I'm starting with the letter R, I'm going to call it reconnect. You need to get, get, get back together again with that person who has an issue with you. Well, that's kind of scary though, isn't it? Somebody's mad at you, are you like really eager? Oh, this person really hates my guts. Let's get together for coffee. <laughs> yeah, probably not, but, but that's the command of Jesus. Because that's what it takes to restore the relationship. Well, you could say to me, okay, Alan, well, what if, what if they've done wrong to me? Then I get to stand here and wait until they grovel down at my feet and say, would you forgive me for the evil, wrong, wicked thing I've done? And until then, I get to stay here and be just <clears throat> snooty. Uh, but we're in chapter 18. Jesus said the other way around. If your brother sins against you, look at that word again, go and tell him your fault between he and you alone. In other words, it doesn't matter if you've done the wrong, they've done the wrong, you both done the wrong, or nobody's done anything wrong, you just don't like each other. Go and be reconciled. Get the relationship restored. You've got the responsibility to take the initiative. Don't wait for the other person. You go out there and make it happen. And that's the first key to seeing real hell take place. But then the second one, notice Jesus said, go and be reconciled. That's the second R. Big word that means to get the relationship restored. And it involves two pieces. Two parts to this. And we see them both in what's often called the Lord's Prayer. If you grew up in a Catholic church, you may have called it the Our Father. It's also found in the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew chapter 6. I grew up in a, in a mainline church, never really heard about the need to invite Jesus to be my Savior. But we still said the Lord's Prayer every Sunday. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors now, now think about what that means debts i mean we, we think of debts as being money that we owe somebody but but it's more than that it is the wrongs that we have done against god forgive us our debts all the wrong things that have happened and as we understand as we just celebrated in communion jesus came to pay off our debts that separated us from god that's the message of the bible isaiah 59 2 says your sins have cut off god's face from you so he does not hear you we, we have been severed eternally. We deserve hell because we've all done and said and felt wrong things. But Jesus paid the price by dying on the cross for our sins. So when we believe in him, those sins are forgiven. We have eternal life. But here in the middle of this prayer that he taught us to pray, he says, just as we forgive our debtors, that is those who have done wrong things against us. And the prayer goes on after that, and he said, Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And immediately he goes back to the same issue in his teaching and says, For if you forgive people their sins against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you don't forgive them, neither will your Father forgive you. That is serious business. Your relationship with God is dependent on your relationship with other people. So if you're sitting here this morning and there's somebody, even as I'm speaking, it's like, why is this guy talking about it? I, I don't want to think about that person right now. I hate that person. I can't believe you don't understand what they've done to me. You have no idea the wrong that they've done to me. And you know what? You're right. I don't. But Jesus knows. And do you have any idea the wrong that you've done to him? And yet he willingly came. He came to earth. He became one of us. He suffered and bled and died on the cross to restore the relationship. He's not asking you to do anything he hasn't done a hundred times over. The question is, will you? Will you? Whatever it is. And again, I'm not saying you have to pretend it didn't hurt. I'm not saying you have to pretend that it was okay. It wasn't. What I am saying is you have to let go your desire to hold on to the bitterness and the anger and the unforgiveness. Right. <clears throat> I was raised in a family where I unfortunately saw this lived out. Now, my dad, a great great man. I loved him, and he had a close relationship with his sister, just a year older than he is. 
and his children, they grew up and she got married and there became a little bit of an issue between her new husband and my father that blew up into a huge, huge issue. Severed their relationship before I was born and was not reconciled until his sister passed away. What a pain that I saw growing up. And I ended up adopting that attitude in my own heart. And I was filled with bitterness and anger and unforgiveness to a whole bunch of people, most of whom probably didn't mean any harm against me whatsoever. I had no idea. And yet I was so bitter. And I never realized I was building my own prison cell. I had built my own prison cell by this bitterness and unforgiveness and, and just couldn't experience joy, couldn't experience peace, just waiting for those people to come and set me free, never realizing that I held the own, my own key in my hand. And the irony was I could never get my own lock open unless I opened the lock in which I was holding in other people by unforgiveness. And the day I read this passage understood what it meant, I'll never forget the freedom I experienced and the joy that still impacts my life to this day. And if you're here, if you don't know what the life of joy is like, I'm going to ask you to do two things before we're done. Number one is to invite Jesus to be your Lord and Savior. And number two is to make a commitment to do what you can to reconcile these relationships. It may be hard. It's not always easy. People are not always open. I had somebody come up to me after the first service and say his own son has cut off the relationship and refuses to talk. But Paul tells us in Romans 12, 18, if possible, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with all people. You know, sometimes you can only do so much. You cannot force the other people to come and be willing to reconcile. But you do what you can. You don't let it go. You don't hold that bitterness. You forgive. You step forward. And you live differently because of it. Ephesians chapter 4 and 5 are just some of the best words ever on relationship. And Paul wraps up Ephesians 4 and verses 31 and 32 with a contrast. Two different ways you can live. Verse 31, he says, let all bitterness, that's holding that unforgiveness. And wrath, that's desiring to get revenge. And anger, that's screaming and shouting. And clamor, making a noise. Slander, talking bad about other people behind their back. And malice, wanting to hurt other people. Let that all be put away from you. Instead, be kind to one another. Tender-hearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. And that's the way to live. Which way do you live? You know, I'm going to ask you to pull out your phone again. Take it out. You know, we, we have a unique opportunity now in our generation we didn't have 10 years ago. You can pull it up and pull open your favorite text app, which one you use, and find the person you text and interact with the most often. It may be a spouse, maybe a friend, maybe your boss. And just look through your, your recent texts. Go back a few days. Which do you see? Do you see verse 31? Bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, slander, malice? Or do you see kindness, tenderheartedness, forgiveness? You know, it's not easy to live this way, but it works. You change your expectations of others. You change your interaction, your relationship. There is an unbelievable freedom and joy and peace that comes. You know, it's kind of funny. Science is just now discovering what Jesus told us 2,000 years ago. Sean Acor, who's a Harvard researcher, one of the most popular recent TED Talk guys, 15 million views of his, we of his message. It was based on his book called The Happiness Advantage. And he studied all kinds of people for 10 years. And guess what he discovered? It's not what happens to you that makes you happy. It's not other people and how they treat you that makes someone happy. It is your choice. You don't sit around waiting for other people to come to you. It's like Paul says. Paul gives it as a command of Philippians 4, 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. You know, it's a command. It's not dependent on your circumstances. You choose to rejoice regardless of what happens to you. But notice, it's in the Lord. It's what Jesus does for you. And that's the key to freedom that can empower you to be kind-hearted, tender-hearted toward one another, to forgive, to experience the life of freedom and joy that you were designed to have. And you begin to do that, then you can move on to the third step of health in your relationship is reach forward to a better future. 
We can call it brainstorming if you like. It's dreaming together. It's once you're reconciled, say, let's find a better way. So many times we look at it narrowly. It's my way or your way. But in reality, there's a lot of possible solutions. And it's getting together and dreaming and envisioning. Acts 15 tells the story of an early split in the church between the Apostle Paul and Barnabas and some of the Jewish Christians who felt like the, all the Gentiles need to do all the Jewish stuff if they're going to really be accepted by God. And Paul said, no way. But they came together in Jerusalem. They met. They worked it out. They found a way to fix it. And I love the way that they wrote the letter. James, who wrote the letter James, says he summarizes it. that All the churches know it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and us. And this is our solution. That's the best way to solve it, isn't it? To know as we get together, the Lord is with us. He helps us find a better way. And we can dream that. And you know what? I don't know your situations and, and what you're going through right now. I found a study. It's called a longitudinal study that's been done on married couples since the 1980s. They got married in the 80s, and researchers went and took a look at how they dealt with conflict in their marriage. And then followed them to see how many of them got divorced, and how many of them are happy in their marriage, and all these other things. And guess what they found out? They looked at it three different ways that you can deal with conflict. One is a destructive way, that's screaming, yelling, throwing things, calling each other names, all that kind of stuff. There is the constructed, that is sitting together and working it out. And there is the withdrawal, that is running away. Kind of like the fight or flight, we call it. People who do the fight mode have four times likelihood of getting divorced. And in the long run, they are not happy in their marriage. But those who do it in the healthy way, sitting down, working it out together, find that their, their marital satisfaction, their enjoyment of their marriage relationship continues to grow and grow and grow over their lifetime. And you got to see my beautiful life partner, best friend, lover, and wife. It'll be 30 years this September of marriage. And I can tell you... We're not perfect. We have never been perfect. We had a lot of issues early on, a lot of stuff we had to get worked out. But you know what? I would not trade my time with Kira for anything. And our, our level of love and marriage has continued to grow and grow and grow because when the problems come, we chose to fix it God's way with God's help. And there's nothing I'd rather have for you. So as we close out, I, I just invite you, we're going to take a look at that, that passage again, Ephesians 4, 31. Let's go to 32 this time. Be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. Notice those words, as God in Christ forgave you. If you believed in Jesus, your sins are forgiven. Your relationship with God is restored. He goes on in the next chapter to say, and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us. A fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. That's why we do communion, to remember the ultimate love was shown by sacrificing himself for us. So as we close, again, I'm not going to try to pretend that the pain that, that others have inflicted to you didn't hurt. Or that it's right. That's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is I want you to fix it with God's help. To forgive them, to confess your faults, to reconnect, to get together again, to reconcile the relationship reach forward to a better future but of course to do that right you've got to do it with God's help so if you've not yet come into a relationship with Jesus I just want to invite you to make that step forward I invite you everywhere across the room this morning would you just bow your head and close your eyes and if you're here and you don't yet know Jesus as your Lord and Savior you've not yet come to that same place of saying Jesus I know I've messed up I, I confess my I need you I need that forgiveness we've been hearing about the Bible says, by faith, we experience that grace that saves us. And that faith that is acknowledged, as Paul says in Romans 10, 9 and 10, he says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. I'm going to invite you to raise your hand to him to just say, Lord, I need you. And if that's you here this morning, you want to know Jesus. You want your sins forgiven. Would you raise your hand? See your hands. See hands all over the room. And next to all who are here, we're going to say a prayer for you in just a minute, but others as well. It may be that there is a relationship that needs to be restored. Maybe it's your fault. Maybe it's their fault. It doesn't matter. You want to take initiative. You want to fix it. You want to get it worked out. 
If that's you this morning, you'd like me to pray for you so that Lord would just open the doors of opportunity and, and open just a real reconciliation. Would you raise your hand to say, Jesus, I don't want to go on anymore with this broken relationship. I want to experience your grace. I want to experience the freedom. I want to unlock my, the prison self that has been biting us too long. Thank you. And Lord, you see all of these hands. And Lord, I thank you for your grace that has brought those new into your family. And I pray that right now, Lord, you would touch them with the power of your Holy Spirit. That they would know that they know that they know that they have been forgiven. That you welcome them. That you love them. That your grace is greater than anything that they've ever done. And Lord, we lift up these others. These who, have, who are in the midst of dealing with pain, Lord. And I pray that you would give them the courage to take that step to reconnect. And give them wisdom to reconcile, the courage to confess their part in what has happened and to forgive the wrong that's been done to them. And Lord, I pray for that conviction on the other side. As I've seen so many times, when one takes the courage to reconcile, healing and reconciliation can happen. And I pray that it would. Would your Holy Spirit touch each and every one of them today? And Lord, I pray that all, everyone here today, would go away with the fresh filling and empowering of your Holy Spirit, that we would live in a way that brings you honor and glory and gives us a life of joy you've created us for. In Jesus' name.